Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 74, The Laws of Howell. You know, sometimes the best laid plans. Uh, I've been researching this particular episode for a bit and uh, was preparing to... Uh, I was working on the script, effectively, when, uh, unfortunately, work and everything just kind of caught up to me all last week, and uh, so it meant our episode slipped by a week. Uh, my apologies. If you're listening to this from the future, you won't understand this, but it uh, it did happen, and uh, hopefully it won't happen again. But, yeah, can't. sometimes it just works like that. But uh, anyway, how about we move on into the episode, shall we? Sometimes when you research Welsh history, there are several things I would point out that become difficult when you're dealing with this same history. Sometimes the amount of myth-making on all sides can get in the way of finding the truth. And in some cases, it becomes a part of the conflict between different groups because some groups argue for this myth, some other groups argue for this myth, some people have bits of the truth, other people have their own other bits of the truth. And sometimes then those don't coalesce. It creates problems. I mean, just think back to founding myths of most countries, be they England, Wales, Scotland, America, uh, you know, any of these places around the world. The founding myths typically are based on just that, myths. There's largely idealization that goes on sometimes patriotism takes over and people get very focused on you know the the fact that mom and apple pie kind of stuff uh interrupts actual history and so sometimes as historians look at issues and start to evaluate uh notions that existed in the past sometimes it makes people very upset because it goes against the common myth or the common understanding. Look at the case of King Arthur. It's a very difficult thing to get into because you're always worried about the reaction of people to stepping on the toes of a myth and something that's so fundamental to the way people understand how things came about. And you can look at that with religious texts. You know, I mean, someone says that the Bible isn't a real history. For some people, that's going to be real difficult for them to overcome. And, and we can say that about the Quran or about all sorts of documents that have religious significance to people's faith. You know, for someone to come in and for some people ruin that idea that this exists and or that it's understood in a certain way can be fought against. It can be reasons why people get angry at academics at times, and it can create hostility, or it can shatter idealism and ideas that people previously had. And so going into this, I just want you to understand, this is kind of where we start from with this, because a lot of people go, oh, the laws of Howell, that obviously must have meant that, that they were created by him, and that they were used by him, and that they existed in his time period. Well, we're going to talk about it. And there may be some myths that we're going to break fairly quickly here. And I just want you to be aware of that as we go into this discussion, that there's going to be some things about this which aren't going to be as straightforward or as simple as they, well, let's be honest, most of Welsh history has been so far, which is not very straightforward and not very simple. So let's begin at the beginning, I guess. So Huel the Good, or the lawmaker, or the king of Britain, or the king of Doithbarth, existed in a time period in the 10th century. We know this, obviously, from the records that we have and from the evidence, both within sources in Wales at the time and sources outside of Wales. He was on charters and agreements with King uh, Alfred. So we know he was around. We know he was a significant part of contributing to a more international reach than just his insular uh, area that he covered. And so it's easy to see who he is. He had the luck of also being a descendant of Rodri the Great. So thus his legacy as one of the sons of Rodri, or in this case grandson, meant that he was kind of in the predominant spot when it came to the annals that were created that we feel a lot of which came out of the South to begin with and out of Doithbarth. So there's sort of a, an ideological bent towards him anyway. Combined with that, the fact that he was 
uh, if not very popular, apparently got to a point where he was controlling most of Wales. And there is this notion that he was a very good king. This notion comes out of the idea that the laws that we have represent his laws. They are the earliest and best known Welsh laws that we have and what a government would use in cases to judge their people or judge themselves as the case may be. So these laws are critical. They're important. The problem is, and, and where the struggle begins, is it's actually very difficult to pinpoint when they really began and whether or not they have any actual relationship to Howell at all. Um, this stems from the fact that the first official records we have actually come from the, the mid-13th century, sort of the 1200s. Most of the, the charters and laws and all of that kind of thing were created in a time period well after these kings existed. And there was all sorts of claims made for various reasons, like, you know, if if the arch the Bishop of Landaff wanted a specific type of land or he wanted a certain area, um, they kind of they <laughs> conveniently have a charter that tells them they own that. Um, so there is a lot of concern that propaganda and myth making and uh, political maneuvering had as much to do with why these were here as actual history. And so it's very difficult to separate those two. The other problem is we don't have other charters to base them off of. They're kind of the only ones of their kind to that point that exist in Wales. And it, 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 there's not record after record after record after record. You know, it's not like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle where there's five or six or seven or eight copies of them lying around that even make it to our, you know, as far as we know to much later date. We don't have these things. And so in reality, that also affects it when you only have one or two things over history. It does mean that somebody cared enough to keep it, but it does also mean that these records might not exist anywhere else and may only be in the imagination of some people. Just look at at uh, Jeffrey and his histories of the King of Britain and how much of that has been debunked as false history, but for many, many years influenced historians and the public and still does to this day about what went on in the so-called Dark Ages or early medieval period or late Roman period, depending on your perspective. So his influence of Jeffrey Monmouth's is so large that it's very difficult to get past for some people. So all of these things taken as they are, like I said, the first evidence we have of this record comes from the middle of the 13th century, which basically is the very tail end of the kingdoms of Britain, the kingdoms of Wales. There isn't any evidence before that of them, at least in a written sense. And in fact, there's a lot of questioning as to whether or not they were an invention that were then attached to Huel to give them a form of, uh, you know, special linkage or special ancestry so that people gave them credit for something that may or may not have been the case. In fact, we can actually look, and there are two historians at the beginning of the last century who bickered about what exactly these laws were and how they predated the period they show up in. Uh, a fairly famous Welsh historian, J.E. Lloyd, uh, writing the history of Wales in a very large volume. And even today, because his work is influential enough, you'll find him referenced in all sorts of documents. I know, for example, if you looked up stuff on Wikipedia, for example, you're going to find him referenced partially because the books are out of copyright. You're also going to find him referenced in other academics. And in fact, as found in, in this case for me, in Charles Edwards' uh, seminal work on that period. So he is a big part of those who considers these laws to have been ancient in date and actually gives a, a summary of them and 
basically suggests that they are accurately from that period of time, from the 10th century, and from the, or even as early as the 9th century. So he definitely argued that. Conversely, J.G. Edwards, uh, in a lecture given in 1928, basically decried this and went against these ideas and suggested that these texts weren't preserved till 1250, but rather that they had actually were an invention later on and criticized the idea that these records were somehow from that period of the 10th century. And uh, so there is a conflicting idea, even amongst academics, about how legitimate you can consider these records and how, as, as far as their linkage back to how, how it goes, we know they existed at the end of the, the, the princely period, but we don't know whether they existed in full. But we have some guesses, we have some ideas, and one of the things that we're going to talk in depth about is um, Charles Edwards' point of view that he feels that they definitely did exist prior to that era. So let's get into exactly why he considers them that way. So as you can imagine, a modern scholar is going to look at this a little differently. He doesn't necessarily say that these laws are completely from the 13th century or from the 10th century, but rather looks at the nuances of them. One of the points he makes is that if you look at the laws, it's obvious that some parts of them predate the Norman invasion. And the one he points out specifically early on is about the marriage laws, which appear to be very old and probably are ones that didn't come from a current period when they were written into this book. The problem becomes is that, as Charles Edwards points out, it's not that these laws don't predate the Norman invasion. It's that the, these laws, in some respect, look like they may predate even... Howell himself and may go back as far as the 5th and 6th centuries. And if you compare them to Irish laws, there is some similarity to that tradition. And because of that, there is a thought that they definitely go back much farther than, than what's thought here. An example that's given is the Seven Bishops' House of Dovid. Now, this story or legal description, this manuscript, doesn't come in every version of the law that we have to start with, and that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that this separate section of law is actually named with an author who's not Howell, but a guy by the name of Justicius. So that makes it a Latin manuscript that is much older than what we have, and that's a very fascinating thing to think about, that it's much earlier than what we've thought of. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of the new Medal of Honor podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, brought to you in partnership with the National Medal of Honor Museum. In each three-minute episode, we'll learn about a different service member who distinguished him or herself through an act of valor. We'll include stories from the Civil War to Iraq and Afghanistan, and from all branches of the military. We'll talk about service members who were overlooked for the medal at first due to their race or religion, and about those who were celebrated at the time. We'll hear stories of soldiers like Audie Murphy, future Hollywood star who mounted a burning tank to hold off German infantry in World War II, and people like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, a Civil War Army doctor and the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor so far. Learn about these heroes and more wherever you get your podcasts. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade 
acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. Of course, adding to the problem is the fact that there are divisions which seem to appear to relate to northern Wales, especially Gwynedd, and southern Wales, and especially Doithbarth. There is not a uh, clear linkage in those two groups, and that also will show division, because obviously they wouldn't have divided like that if it not for differences in the kingdoms, differences in the way they acted and reacted and did things. So there's that as well. Now, do we have the actual author of these documents? Is there someone that we could point to that maybe have collected and wrote this law and put it into practice? And again, uh, D. Jenkins as well as Charles Edwards have advocated that there is someone of that nature and that his name is Yorwith. Now, Yorwith Ap Madog Ap Raud, and I apologize for pronunciation, but there you go. Uh, we think that he have, may have been the author that formed what we have and that he himself had belonged to a group of lawyers and poets in Arvon and it was because of him that we have this record in the 13th century. The other option, or the second tradition, uh, says that it's an offshoot of a bunch of Latin traditions that were then collected into one, and that's where we get this law from. And that, unlike a specific individual, it is basically a living document that was then collected and created into a single document. In all of this, of course, that could have been compiled by Howell. He may have been the one to do it. If that's the case, then, you know, he could call... You could say that these are the laws of Huell because he's the one who gathered them together, made them one collective document, and then put them out. But again, we're unsure, and we only have some some speculation on that front. So when was all this codified? When do we think that things started to become standardized, become one law book instead of a muddle of various ideas and laws and manuscripts and stories and all of this, and became what we now know as that uh, thing that we now call the laws of Howell? Well, what we think likely happened is they started to diverge between Doithbarth and, and Gwyneth, and thus we get the version that we have with Iowith and the version that we have with Lord Rhys in Doithbarth. And this is said to have happened about 1197. Uh, and that these at this point, there's already to have been separations, but they were still similar in the way they were organized and how older versions linked to the newer versions and all of that kind of thing. Um, so we have that to look at and to consider when we look at these things. The one thing that comes out of all this is that we know that these laws don't appear to be issued from a king in the fact that they're not edicts, they're not commands, they appear to be more like like decision-making and manuals of how you judge and, and adjudicate laws. So in a way, they're a bit more in cooperation and in common with the Irish laws than they are with, say, a Germanic law like the Anglo-Saxon laws that they had, which is really interesting because then it makes one wonder if there's actually the original source for these laws is actually not British at all, but is rather an Irish tradition that was then passed as Irish people migrated into the south and north of Wales and brought these codified laws with them, 
or through the years and years of contact, was there some measure of passing them back and forward? So it's really interesting when you kind of consider that. And again, it goes back to this linkage between Ireland and Wales and how they coexisted with one another through all this period. And probably going back even into the early ages of both of these lands. So there is that. So let's have a look at some of it and kind of the makeup of it and kind of what they are. Um, I mean, we're not going to get deep into it because there's so much here. And realistically, there's so much that it would take many episodes to honestly cover it properly. So the first part is a prologue, which uh, is made up of probably by the Celtic Charter and is more than likely something um, that existed prior to the Norman Conquest. The next is the Laws of the Courts, which is something of a, a document just discussing how courts work and things like marriage and what is expected of a bride and her groom in those things and, and that kind of idea. Um, and some parts may go back earlier than the 10th century, but likely not all of it does. Uh, then the next part is the laws of the country, um, which includes the four lists of nine, the three columns of law, and the nine-tongued ones, which are some fantastic names. Um, it appears to be influenced by Anglo-Saxon period rules and ideas. And because there was so much crossover between the two groups, it's very likely that, that, that the Welsh were influenced by this. Keep in mind that, that there's no firm border like we would think of a border. There would be migration between both sides in and out of the various uh, kingdoms. And so you would probably have influential scholars. Well, I mean, look at Alfred. Alfred was influenced by a South Welsh uh, clergyman. Uh, so all of these people would have talked and had ideas and likely this affected this and would point to a linkage to a pre-Norman but not pre-Howell link because these are the kind of things that were being worked out in the Anglo-Saxon period much later than the early times and the early period of the kingdoms. So this would definitely be something that would be much more around the 10th century and later and not something linked to back farther than that. Uh, as part of that, it uh, included things that uh, are coming post the Norman Conquest, things of the value of the wild and tame, or corn damage, or joint plowing. These are very specific things. And most likely, some of it was linked to earlier Irish laws. Some of it was probably linked, though, to similarities to Norman rules and Norman ideas. Uh, the next one is surety ship, um, which is something of an Irish law idea, and so probably has influence there. And then there's a whole section on women, um, and this is about divorce and about how various things happen for women in, in various ways. And some of this probably predates everything. Um... And sometimes this may be older than we know. And there's no way to know in some cases whether these laws even predate the Romans because there may have been forms of them even before that. But certainly this predates modern, well, modern, medieval periods in the late Middle Ages and the high Middle Ages. So it's definitely not considered to be a Norman ideal or a post-Norman invasion kind of thing. Um, and then the last sort of major section talks about the value of houses and trees and equipment, all of which sound very Norman in their, their way of writing and their way of thinking. The Normans had a great deal of stock in keeping track of things so that the king's court would know exactly what everybody owned and had and possessions so that if they wanted to seize them, they knew what they were seizing. So it would be something that would obviously have influenced the Welsh kings from that period on. So it's probably a mix of Norman, Irish, 
ancient Welsh, ancient British, and the 10th century all mixed into one. And so it's a collection of items. Could Howell have collected them? Certainly. And could it have influenced both the North and the South? Absolutely, because we know that Huell's descendants ruled both at for a very long period of time afterwards. So there is reason to believe that these documents definitely affect the way we look at Wales, both as a society now and as a society then. And it, as I said before, does it devalue the influence of Huell if it isn't him? If it's another writer who's collected these documents or another writer who wrote them down? I don't think it does. I think it leaves him still as an important person. He likely is ascribed to them for reasons, some of which may be mythical in nature, uh, because they knew he was a good king, or at least they thought he was. And so thus, later writers and later thinkers and later people looking at it just said, well, a good king would have good laws, and these are good laws. So that would influence who they are, it would influence what they were doing, and it would influence their mentality. And we know that within... <clears throat> the descendants of Mervyn, this was most definitely something they considered. The links to the past were important to them. The links to kings, both old and new, were critical in how they perceived themselves and how they pushed their agenda politically in the 13th century. And as we get closer to this period, we'll know more about this and we'll know more about how the influences of the conflicts of that era did more to push a certain agenda forward than, say, for example, ancient ideals and ancient concepts. I mean, by this point, they're no longer really calling themselves Britons. By the 13th century, they're calling themselves Cumbria or Welsh, and there's not that link anymore. So that's one of the big differences between now and then. So that's something we'll look at and we'll evaluate as we go forward, and we'll certainly talk more and more about this as we do. Uh, thank you so much for your patience with this episode. I, I hope it's informative. I would suggest going to look up more on it. I mean, if you want to get into the weeds of the law itself and kind of the good, the bad, the indifferent about it and why people look at it as very progressive in some respects and very convoluted in others, you're more than welcome to do that. And I would suggest starting with John Lloyd because he was the first more modern writer to actually write it all down and i'm sure there are more books around that you can get access to it there's no way in one episode i can definitely dig into it enough to really do it justice but i wanted to talk more about the origins and kind of how it came about and what is new and what is old and what is borrowed and what is blue more or less um but next week we'll we'll be more along the road of, of what's going on in post norman wales and we'll talk about more in depth on that as we move ahead. Uh, certainly, we'll get talking much more about the Gwyneth way of doing things and how it starts to differ and how the push in the South creates problems for the, the North Welsh. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. And I hope as always you'll check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com as we have a number of things that we do do and i hope you have a great day and we'll see you all next time bye bye edge of the abyss creations is a proud sponsor of the welsh history podcast your one-stop shop for unique jewelry paintings and other crafty creations you can find us at facebook.com slash edge of the abyss one this has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. I'm Daniel Norcross. And I'm Rory Dollard. And between us, we are England Cricket on 99.94. We'll be every week looking at the ups, the downs, the runners, the riders, the news and the views on all things English cricket. And believe you me, there are plenty of ups and downs. Join us, England Cricket, on 99.94.